Hello and welcome to a new Dark Souls lore episode. My name is Alex, or Silvermont, and today we're going to be continuing our talk on the Lost Crowns trilogy. And I hope I'm not being preemptive, because Scholar of the First Sin isn't far away, but if any new information comes out of that, all to the good. Last time we spoke about Shulva, the Sanctum City, and this time we're going to be covering the Old Iron King and his Broom Tower. And what an apt name that is, broom meaning mist or fog. And there is a presence in the fog that hangs on those immense structures. And that presence belongs to another child of dark, another spawn of Manus. What is the tale of the old Iron King? Unique amongst the Lost Crowns, we knew a little about the Iron King before it was ever even announced. We even defeated the old Iron King in the base game to obtain a Lord Soul. In fact, I believe the only king whose soul we cannot claim in any way is that of the Sunken King. But let's review what we know about the old Iron King, shall we? A Lord of little consequence, the Iron King could have been a duke or baron owing his allegiance to the kingdom of Ven. But whoever he was doesn't matter in the end. What matters is what he did and who he became. After all, does it matter that your chosen undead began their journey wasting away in a cell of the Undead Asylum? No, what matters is that your chosen undead eventually linked the fire, or became the Dark Lord. At some point, the Iron King was found by a wandering knight from the east, Sir Alon, who chose to serve the Lord. Why? We can only speculate but Alon became the king's most trusted knight. Was it Alon who encouraged the Iron King to wage war against the Kingdom of Ven? Or did he merely relish the ambition of this irrelevant lord and think him a man worthy of his blade's service? But it is foolhardy for a lord to an attack an entire kingdom, and it took near everything the Iron King had to seize what, most would agree, was an area of little importance. But it was there that the Iron King found his key, and it was there that he became the Iron King. It seems the Scorching Iron Scepter was the key to the King's power over iron. Might there be a connection between that and the ability that Vendrick stole from the Giants that seems to involve the Golems? The old Iron King and Sir Alon eventually used this newfound power to conquer Ven and establish the king and his kingdom. But then, at the height of his power, Alon left. To honour the knight, the king bestowed his name upon his greatest knights, the Alon Knights. But even with his most trusted knight gone, the king had others to serve him, such as the Magus Egil. The giant ball that is half sunk into the lava and found shortly before one encounters the old Iron King is named Egil's Idol. And before we knew of the Pyromancer, I thought Egil might well be the name of the king, but now we know better. Egil created the Dance of Fire and Fire Snake Pyromancies, and Fire Snake well demonstrates his love of fire, and how he wished to grant it a will of its own. So we have an Iron King and a potentially crazed pyromancer. And when has a combination like that ever ended well? The circumstances bring to mind a similar crazed king and his fire-obsessed pyromancer. Both kings, whether mad or not, were struck down in one blow. One by a golden kingslayer, the other by a demon. The king had the power to grant life to iron, and it seems to me that perhaps the smelter demon was born of this. The king and Egil working together, perhaps, to create the smelter demon. A demon of fire. But is it a true demon? Quite some time ago, I speculated that perhaps the smelter demon was a remnant of Isolith, transformed by the Iron King's power and awakened by his castle as it sank deep into the earth. And what is deep beneath the earth? Isolith. But now it appears the demon is not a demon in the traditional sense, but rather a creation of the king, and perhaps Egil as well. 
and only one strike was needed to end the Iron King. And these days we know that the chaos of Isolith is indeed present, but not in Broom Tower, but far away in Elaine Lois. The Iron King's keep sank into the earth, and the corpse of the king sank deeper still, until something found it. That which lurks below entered the king's body, and thus was bred Icarus Earth. An amalgamation of the old king and... what? A soul of the ineffable. Another charred king? Most evidence seems to suggest that. Whether it lurked in the fire, or some form of the ancient sunlight king's essence, the soul of Gwyn, or at least, what soul he had left. But that beast was put to rest. Now we know what happened to the old Iron King. He was killed by the smelter demon, and then became Icarus Earth, and Icarus Earth was defeated by the bearer of the curse. But what about Sir Alon? He left, but that is about all we can say for certain. One who is determined enough might even find Alon whilst traversing the past, and see for themselves why he was the old Iron King's most trusted of warriors. And once you see his blade in motion, you start to realise why the king had such a fascination with warriors of renown. The king's influence reached beyond Broom Tower and the Iron Keep. The Huntsman's Copse was the old Iron King's hunting ground, only his game happened to be the undead themselves. There is quite a bit we could talk about there, but perhaps we'll leave that for another time, as this video is more specifically about Broom Tower. And what happened to that tower? Sometime after the Iron King's demise, a most peculiar guest arrived. Nadalia, a fragment of Manus. Much like Alsana, Ilana, and Nishandra, Nadalia sought a king, but hers was gone. Her mission, if it can be even thought of as such, had failed before it truly began. Thus she relinquished her soul and became a great fog, sinking over the towers in a musty embrace, perhaps seeking to be that much closer to her vanished king by enveloping what was left of his kingdom. Who knows how long she remained there? But at some point, another hero came to Broom Tower, Raimi the Vanquished. Once one of Vendrick's greatest warriors, something brought him to clash with Velstart, Vendrick's other great warrior. Once the Raven was his sigil, and Raimi, an agile swordsman, not unlike Artorius, both fought with sword and shield and were renowned for their skills, and both fell to dark. Though as far as we know, Artorius and Ornstein never clashed. Raimi resigned, potentially after suffering a humiliating defeat at the hands of Elstart. Reconsidering his life, he was reborn as a stalwart warrior, and something drew him to Broom Tower, where he had the ability to remove the fog, but instead gave himself to it. Something about Nadalia caused a deep infatuation in Raimi. Could it be that he desired Nishandra? And that the cause of his resignation and clash with Velstant? Is Nadalia a replacement in his eyes? I doubt it, as there's nothing to back that up. But it is something to consider, all the same. What we can say for certain is that Raimi fell to darkness willingly. And is there any crime so vile as that?